My name is Susan Alexander. I'm a consultant shoulder surgeon and uh, I work at Stanmore, the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. My specialist interest is in anything to do with the shoulder. So conditions that start at a young age, such as instability, hyperlaxity, um, that can now be treated using keyhole procedures, all the way through to more complex degenerative conditions such as uh, arthritis, rotator cuff tears associated with arthritis and fractures. Uh, a slightly controversial slide. So when I started training, the relationship between the orthopaedic surgeon and the physio was a hierarchy and this was very much the balance. And the role of the therapist was to treat things that I couldn't operate on, improve things that I did operate on so I looked brilliant, and I'm embarrassed to say that when I started out, I used to write physio referral forms that said things like, shoulder pain, please make better. The Royal RNOH has a long history of treating shoulder instability. And in fact, Bankart, he said, no one who has ever seen this typical lesion could possibly doubt that the only rational treatment is to reattach the glenoid ligament to the bone from which it has been torn. And we still follow that philosophy today. The baton was then handed over to this gentleman, Lippmann Kessel, who amongst many things was a professor of the Institute of Orthopaedics. He established, established the shoulder unit there, but he also set up the first Congress of Shoulder Surgery in London in 1980, and this is still going on today, every three years. The baton was then handed over to this gentleman, Ian Bailey. Again, a prolific uh, in, in, in all aspects of his work. He was medical director at the RNOH, but perhaps more uh, relevant for today's talk, he came up with the concept of the Stanmore Instability Triangle. Firstly, the polar one groups are what you typically recognise as your traumatic structural group. So a rugby player, for example, with a collision injury, abducted, outstretched arm, crank, goes down and tears the labrum. The type 2, or the atraumatic structural group, the typical history you would get from a patient like this is, oh, I was just flicking out a duvet and my shoulder dropped out. If you put a telescope inside the joint, you'll often see some evidence of structural damage to the shoulder. And then the type 3 is the muscle patterning group, a non-structural uh, injuries, where there is problems with their, with their muscle coordination or activation, and uh, if you put a telescope inside the joint, quite often you will see a pristine joint. So we're going to be focusing really with hypermobility on this axis here, the two, three axis. What is interesting about this triangle though, is that even though you may start with a traumatic structural, with recurrent episodes of dislocation, you can move down into the atraumatic structural, so that even with even just turning over in bed, you can dislocate your shoulder. Or you may start off with that, but then the muscles go out of uh, lack of coordination and you get these muscle patterning features that you have to address when you're treating the patient. So hypermobility, this is quite a sort of a, a woolly diagnosis, I think, at that present stage. It's sort of associated with joint hypermobility and it can be associated with the so-called Ellis-Danlos syndrome. Again, quite a tricky one to diagnose. There are four uh, major subtypes. When we go to the examination of the patient, we start off by looking at the general posture of the patient. Are they upright? Are they kyphotic? Are they flat back? Are they sway back? Have a look at the shoulders. Are the shoulders actually in joints? But quite often they'll come presented with their shoulders out of joint. Look at the scapular position in static. Is, is there any evidence of winging? Do they have any balance, any control? Can they stand on one leg? If they can stand on one leg, can they close their eyes and maintain that stance? And then can you ask them to do a one-legged squat? And then look for generalised signs of laxity, such as the Baton score. So can they touch their hands on the floor? Can they put their thumbs back? Can they um, bend their knees backwards? Can they hyperextend the elbows? And can you bend the little finger? So it's a score out of nine. Then we start to look at movement. So the simple movement, which is forward elevation, but I always ask them to come down slowly and I'm always looking at the back. What is their scapular thoracic rhythm doing? Are they winging? At which point are they winging? Are, is the shoulder dislocating backwards? Quite often we call it multidirectional instability, but it isn't. When we looked at our cohort of patients, 95% of them were actually posterior and inferior. And as they lift their arm up, if you look, you can see the ball of the ball of the humeral head just dropping backwards slightly and that's your key and think right we're onto something. Ask them to do abduction and then internal and external rotation in neutral and then with the arm uh, at 90 degrees of abduction. 
I then start looking at the muscle strength. Now, as an orthopaedic surgeon, I was taught to test like this, like this, and like this. And now I've since realized that actually that's pretty primitive and that we should be really isolating these muscles and looking uh, at these muscles in the standing position, lying supine, and lying prone. And also looking at different degrees of abduction. And by doing that, what I've realized is we're looking at inner range work of the cuff and outer range. So if you're up here, your subscap is working in its outer range, whereas your infraspinatus is working in its inner range. And the converse is when you uh, put your arm that way. And then we'd go through a series of improvement testing. So if they can lift their, if they can't lift their arms when they're standing on their flat feet, does standing on tiptoes work? I.e., if you engage the kinetic chain, can this improve it? If it does, then that sort of guides us that they may need some um, work on their core stability. If you hold the scapula, manually hold the scapula, and then ask them to lift it, does it improve? If their symptoms improve, then we need to start looking at periscapular work and looking at those muscles. If that doesn't do anything, asking them to resist an external rotation and go up, i.e. try and engage the cuff in external rotation, does that improve? Guides us to we need cuff recruitment exercises and putting this picture together. So this, this concept of recruitment and strengthening is, is a, was a new one to me and it was a bit woolly to be honest, for, for me and my scientific brain. And I wanted to start looking at this a bit more closely, and we'll come on to those, some of the research that we've been started doing in this area. But we've also looked at underactivity and overactivity of the muscles. Quite often, these patients, when you, when you feel their peck, you can almost pluck a string. You know, you can hear a note, they're so tight. So we inject them with Botox, it takes three weeks for it to work, and then that gives us the time to facilitate the, um, the rehab. Functional electrical stimulation. So if their muscles are really weak and, and their brain just doesn't understand what they're supposed to do, giving them a little buzz, as I call it, as they try and go up, try to engage serratus so that it actively fires. So we get a better understanding of um, how that muscle should work. So just uh, wanted to give you a bit of an overview of what we're doing in our research. We're using EMG to look at muscle activation. Now, the first starting point was really comparing the type of EMG. So there's surface electrodes and there's fine wire electrodes. We did an experiment comparing the two. And what we found was that with surface electrodes, you, you get non-specific activation of the electrodes. They don't always detect large muscles, and you get crosstalk from activation from other muscles. So the ideal situation is you want to stick in intramuscular electrodes. However, not, patients don't really like that. So what we thought as a solution is get away from the idea of sticking something here and saying, I'm now looking at subscapularis. Well, you're not really, are you? You're looking at a movement. So we now call them move, groups of movements, so not muscle specific. So in one experiment, we wanted to look at the effects of lower limb position, i.e. the kinetic chain on external rotation. And we tested a whole series of different postures to see where the muscle is more actively recruited. So we did both feet standing on one leg, standing on the opposite leg, tiptoe sitting, wobble board to really ch uh, challenge the kinetic chain, lying on your side, lying on, on your front and um, with your arm abducted. When you look at an EMG signal, for those of you who haven't seen it, this is what you get, it's nonsense. So we put it through a MATLAB sequence, that gives us detrended EMG data, but we've got positive and negatives there, so we rectify that, so we're just looking at positive data. But if you're trying to compare different movements, you need to compare it to something. So you compare it against maximum voluntary contraction, and then you get that lovely, neat line down there. So that's how we get to that point. And what the results of our experiment showed that this is maximum voluntary contraction. If you look at the wobble board, you get the least contraction. So if you challenge the core, you're least able to recruit or produce an active strong contraction of your external rotators. If you lie prone, however, and you have your arm abducted, that significantly improved the amount of activation in your external rotators. So there, I mean, it could be multifactorial. It could be due to load of the arm, but it also could be due to the fact that in that position, the infraspinatus is, is at a stretch. So is it already pre-recruited and uh, designed to be, uh, fire up? That was maximum contraction. But what about what happens in the quiet zone? And this is something that's become very interesting now, particularly when we're going to start applying this to hypermobile patients. The quiet zone is when the muscles 
effectively at rest. And when we looked at that area and took 1,000 points either side, when we analysed the data, all these patients were right-hand dominant. So when you compare the standing position at rest, it's fairly quiet. It's only 1%. That's the, the right um, uh, shoulder. Uh, and when you're lying prone, it's, it's, it increases. But when you look at the non-dominant hand, i.e. the left hand, it's much higher. The resting activity is much higher than in the dominant hand. So the body is struggling to just maintain its position at rest. So that is starting to give us some insights as to where to go next in, in looking at the hypermobiles. And finally, if you want to look at the kinetic chain, we put these electrodes over the, um, the vertebral column for erector spinae, front of thigh, back of thigh, front of leg, back of leg. And what we found that actually, when you do an external rotation, it was all the front muscles that became activated. So if you think about it, when you're doing that, it's almost like there's a compensatory tilt forward to balance it out. So it's almost like at a diagonal. But all of this ba is based on this principle here, which is proprioception. So proprioception, as you will know, has three aspects. It recognises joint position sense, the movements of the joint, and sensation of the force. So when you look at the shoulder joint capsule, there are receptors there, mechanoreceptors. There are two types, basically ones that act slow, constant <coughs> stimuli, and ones that are rapid, that act as beginning and end of stimuli. In the typical traumatic instability lesion, you have a labrum which gets torn. That disrupts the system and you can do a bank heart repair. In patients who are hypermobile, what you often find when you put the telescope in is a big baggy capsule and the inferior ligament, which has three components, a band at the front, a band at the back and a band at the middle, it's kind of dropping away. So you can imagine that the stretch reflex or the, the sensation of force, detection of force, would be poorer or less, um, less sensitive compared to a normal joint. So does surgery have a role in this? And as technology has developed, previously we were using anchors that were made out of metal or plastic, but now we've developed, it has been developed so that they're all out of suture and they're only 1.7 millimetres big. So you can actually use a couple of, a few of these without worrying about the, the bone breaking. And so what I've been developing and what I've been doing with patients now at Stanwall is what I called double barrel stabilization. So two anchors front, two anchors back. So we're hitching, it's, it's like pulling up a pair of knickers, it's hitching the whole thing up. So you've got your anterior band, your posterior band and the in-between. And what I'm hoping is that this now is going to reboot the brain, reprogram the, the sensitivity of the receptors. But does it work? Don't know. So we've set up a trial. It's a randomised clinical trial. Um, we've done 20 patients so far. This, we've published the uh, protocol. And essentially, patients who are suitable for the trial come in. Everybody has a diagnostic arthroscopy to see if they're suitable. If they are suitable, you then open the envelope and we either stop at that stage, so all they've had is a diagnostic arthroscopy, and they continue their therapy. Or we continue with the repair, the double barrel stabilisation. So the Stanmore Triangle, the final thought about this is that it is, we've talked about the mechanisms of injury, but I think that it is more complex than that. And what I haven't talked about today and what we're also looking at is actually maybe a pyramid with pain because the nature of the pain changes. It, it originally starts as a noisy septa pain, pain in response to a stimuli, but we're starting to see a trend towards a neuropathic type of pain, which is a very different mechanism altogether. So to summarise, um, when you're dealing with these patients who present with sh shoulder instability, history, 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 it's key, it's always in the history. You've got to make the right diagnosis to be able to treat the patient. And for me, I would never touch these patients unless I get your help, and I need your help. Um, sometimes you need help from other health, uh, health professionals, um, uh, psychologists, um, they have all sorts of problems that can go wrong, so it's cardiovascular problems, GIT problems, and you have to really exhaust therapy, and I need to be convinced that they've tried everything that they can in therapy before I go ahead and do the capsule application. The role of surgery, well, I examine them under anaesthesia, it helps me with the direction of the instability. I do an arthro arthroscopy to confirm a diagnosis to exclude any structural deformities. I can do a um, stabilisation, but I'm not kidding myself, that's not what's, the, what's working here. What I think I'm doing is temporarily improving proprioception, altering that feedback so that 
you guys can go ahead and work with your rehabilitation because that's really what's the key here. So where I started from here with the orthopedic surgeon and the physiotherapist there, what I've now begun to realize that actually when you're treating these patients, it's a revolution. I'm down here and it's you guys who are up here and I'm facilitating what you do. Thank you very much. <laughs>